sometimes it's so difficult for us as humans to understand how animals can react to things. And sometimes it is very important for us to try and come up with theories. How do we measure or how do we understand how does another animal think? I'm not talking here humans. There are a lot of psychologists here and probably know that they study humans, such as Andrew's study about richness and being happy. I work in the engineering, I'm a professor in engineering, but I'm very happy, not because of the pay I get, but because the type of work I do. And the work that I'm interested in is what can I contribute to the society in general. So I get happiness from that, but I agree with this theory that there are a lot of people who actually believe the more richer you are, the more happy you are. But I also know a lot of people who are very rich and extremely unhappy. Sorry about picking on that, but uh, I think it's interesting to see it in that context. <clears throat> I'm just going to go through the content of the type of things that I like to talk about. I know I was introduced in the area of virtual reality. Before you talk about virtual reality, I'm interested in what is known as virtual environments. Virtual reality are little things within that environment. So this is the context of my presentation. I will talk about virtual reality, and then I will lead on to something called locomotion. If you imagine now, I'm standing in this building, but I want to navigate the campus of the University of Warwick. And my constraint is I can only walk in this space. So how would I do this in a real world? I, I have to leave this room, go out there, and start finding the map of the campus, and follow all that route. If I want to do that in here and make you experience that, I will talk about how do you do virtual locomotion, and why virtual locomotion is very, very important. Uh, if you want to create virtual environments. Another thing I'm interested in is in reverse engineering applications within the healthcare domain. Uh, my background is really automotive engineering kind of thing. It's only in the last uh, eight, nine years that I've ventured in to see how can I apply my know-how in engineering in other sectors such as the healthcare. Okay, when we talk about virtual environments, what does it mean? What is it? So here, what it allows you to do is in a limited space or using some kind of computer graphics, big screens like this, okay, and we can actually create that environment in which we can conduct experiments. What kind of experiments would you like to conduct in that sort of thing? If you imagine today, a lot of talk is going on about terrorist you know, attacks. How would you train the civilians what to do if such an attack occurred? London Underground was a very good wake-up call for us in UK. What we could have done there, since that has happened, is to try and train people who are using London Underground every day, what, they, what steps they should take. And this you can do in a controlled environment by building virtual environments. To do it in a London Underground station is very expensive because you have to close down the underground station. All business in London will stop for that duration. So, what other, what other things does virtual environments allow us to do? We can actually, as you know, we all deal in ICT every day, yeah? We have a lot of data that we have. Half the time, we can't even find a file on our own PC because we, there's no system today to allow you to find that file. Unless you remember the name and then use a search thing, fine. If you don't remember the name, we're stuck with it. So, we have a lot of data, okay? How do we visualize this data? And once we can actually visualize the data in so many different forms, I again refer to Andrew's presentation, we saw lots of interesting graphs which typically come from the finance sector. If I can convert that diagram or that graph into something else in 3D, we can be able to interpret it in a completely different way. So these kind of environments are very, very useful to us. Okay, I go into the area of virtual reality. I have only one slide here on virtual reality, as I am sure that you all read quite a lot about this. If you've been to Disney, you all experienced something around this kind of topics. On the right-hand side of the screen, from where you are sitting, you see somebody wearing a head-mounted display. That head-mounted display is for military application, that's why it looks so ugly and bulky. <laughs> okay. Typically, today, you can have head-mounted displays that are like your specs, okay, as light as your specs, okay? What are the advantages of this kind of technology? Well, you can carry it in your pocket, you can wear it quickly, and you can visualize whatever you wanted to see, for example. The bulky things are very useful for military purposes because what they're actually doing on there, they're actually getting messages from 
a bunker somewhere in London who are planning the war, who has never been in Iraq or anything, okay? But how the hell do they know how to plan this war? So these guys on the field are actually capturing certain aspects of the environment there, and this environment is being transferred to the bunkers in London or wherever they are, and now they're making the decision. That's why it's bulky, it's got a lot of IT systems fit into it. If you look at that chap's hand, what he's actually got is some kind of a mechanical device, and this device allows the person to be able to touch virtual things. The virtual environments consist of all these kind of items. On the left side there, that's uh, a dream that I had. I know somebody used the word dream earlier on in the presentation. That was my dream idea. What you see at the bottom is a reality that exists in the university here, and I will give you examples of what do we do with such things. Here is an example of locomotion. Watch carefully what is happening with the person. The person is trying to walk with that head-mounted display on, and he's trying to walk <coughs> through a big place like Buckingham Palace, for instance. But his movement is limited within a small space. If you want to do this, what you've got to do is when I walk across, you've got to bring me back somehow. So if you look at this video, that's what was happening. Very complex device. This guy, Hiro Iwata, is a professor in Japan who spent almost 25 years of his life not on these shoes, but on the right here. I'll show you another one of his examples. So this was his dream, and you will see in a few minutes what he has produced. Watch carefully, the person doesn't actually move at all. He's pretty much within two meters. Decided to change his directional. These things are known as omnidirectional treadmill. They are very similar to treadmill. A treadmill is unidirectional, whereas this is omnidirectional. Here you can see that the person is walking in a particular path, but the moving floor or circular floor adjusts automatically by finding out where the person is trying to go. Okay. Fantastic piece of invention. Very expensive piece of kit, okay? And if you look at the engineering underneath this one of these tiles, it's almost uh, a very, very, it's like, almost like a Rolls Royce aero engine kind of stuff gone into it, okay? So at the moment, this is very expensive, but the vision that this person has in providing locomotion is very important. Let me give you an example. If you want to do, if you like um, going skiing, for instance, and some of us, can't ski very well, but would like to experience skiing. So I can't go on the Alps or whatever, but I would like to experience it in an environment like this. Now, to be able to simulate this kind of things, you need this kind of devices. Okay? If I want to climb the mountain, when I climb the mountain, my body angles are different, but something happens to my ankle joint. How do I simulate that such I get the right forces coming off my ankle? And that's the kind of work this is leading to. So that's what locomotion is all about. So what did we do in this field? Well, we came up with this idea, something called the cybersphere. And the idea of a cybersphere is to create this virtual locomotion. So I showed you some of other people's work. Now I'm talking about the work which we took place here at Warwick University. It's a big ball, three and a half meters in diameter. It's made of acrylic, so it's a translucent object. Uh, and the whole ball is supported on a cushion of air. And the idea is everybody's, I think somebody mentioned the hamster in a wheel today. This is really, sorry, did I say that right? Yes, correct. Hamster in a wheel, this is human in a 3D ball. And the idea in a 3D ball is you would walk in any direction that you choose. We don't dictate you at all. And as you walk, the ball rotates. And our idea is to track the ball. And then we will realize which direction you're trying to go. And outside the ball, we have a series of projectors. And what we do with the projectors, it will update all your images. So if you imagine somebody at my age is trying to walk in this thing, I can walk very slowly. But some of the younger ones here, they might get to run in there. So they control that environment with natural interface. That's your legs. And the idea here is to use natural interface and not interfaces that I have to learn, do I press this button or that button? Yeah. So that was the dream, 
that was the design of it, okay? And from the design, that's what the real thing looks like. And hopefully, the technology works. After a hard day battling the bad guys, this was produced in the year 2000. And this is uh, a little clip that was made by BBC. So I'll let you watch this for a while. The right was based on the level of the actual science of virtual reality, which is one big drawback. Unlike the holodeck, in virtual reality you cannot physically walk anywhere. You're stuck in one place. That's the kind of head-mounted displays people used to produce before. Well, in the US, on making systems which enable people to walk freely. Um, this is the most simple way of doing it. The simple solution is called the cybersphere. <laughs> <laughs> That's the best publicity we got on this. The computer generated landscape is projected onto the sphere which floats on a cushion of air. As you walk, the sphere rotates and the landscape changes accordingly. Okay, that gave you some idea of what the technology is. If anybody is interested in seeing this technology, you're welcome. I work in the university, you'll find my name, Vinesh Raja, somewhere in the university list. Give us a call and we'll be very happy to show you, or you can even have a chance to write the technology. Okay, I'm going to move on to my next topic, which is on reverse engineering. Okay, first of all, I'd like to say, what is reverse engineering? You know, when I was working in the car industry or the aerospace industry, we as humans, we created products such as cars and airplanes or hair dryers or whatever, yeah? They are all human created systems. What we're interested in here is saying what are the natural systems out there and is there a way I can capture that natural thing? And now earlier on, somebody mentioned about a plant on one of the pictures, I think it was Francois' talk, where he said that somebody managed to get a, more details about a particular plant when it was first recognized or whatever. Yeah? The problem with plants, they are 3D things. But at the moment, if you look at the books that talk about plants, they only talk about 2D pictures. I don't really know what, what it looks like from the other side. Same with medical people. Yeah? They are dealing with 3D body, but a lot of the diagrams today that you see are two-dimensional diagrams. It must be difficult for medical students to really understand what it is, and it takes them years after their education to become masters in that. How about using some of these techniques, okay? How do you do this? How do you capture this? There was another speaker, I think, from Durham who was gone. He was talking about capturing data from under the sea. And that's very interesting because not everybody can go down there. So how do I explain to the rest of the world what's down there, yeah? And uh, this is that sort of thing. Here, there are a lot of technologies that can be used to capture. The technology that sits on the top middle is a technology that we invented here at Warwick. And it is now licensed to a company who sells this technology. We, invent, we were inventing this technology for automotive application. And I have to say, we were failures in doing it for automotive. But it's, we found another market for it, which is a very good market. And we can capture people's face, 3D data, very nicely with this camera. Okay? And I'm going to talk about that. So here, we have a person in the bottom middle. This is a person who's been in a car crash. And at the car crash scene, he was dragged straight into ambulance into the A&E department. And he was losing quite a bit of blood, so the A&E guys decided to stitch his face and save the blood loss. At the time, they haven't got the time really to actually stitch it in a particular manner so that after effects, you know what happens when you've got a stitched area on your face, the tissues get hardened, so when you smile, people can see that hard tissue because it doesn't move unless you're fatty like me, you see, then, uh, <laughs> So in order to do this work, what we had to do was to be able to scan his face. And the surgeon that we were working with, he had some very, very interesting idea. His idea was that when you smile, you have a lot of the skin creases, wrinkles, lender lines as they're not. These lender lines are something that if we stitch along them, then when you smile, we are going to minimize the effect of that uh, scar, okay? So that was his theory. The problem with that theory is how do I make somebody smile before I take them to the operating theater? 
or was there in an open theater. I cannot make them smile and say, freeze there, so I know they can come. <laughs> that was the bottom line problem. So what we did here was got the person in, in the Warwick University environment, told them to smile, because there was no other stress on his mind at the time. He smiled, we captured all the wrinkles on his face. Okay? Now it's great, you capture these while he's smiling, but you still got to remember something else is going to happen when he's in the operating theatre. His face would have changed because he's not smiling. So we need to understand the mathematics about transformation of some geometry. Okay? So what we did was from that, we captured that face. From there, we produced the middle bit. And from the middle bit, we went to the third thing. And the third thing became something that fitted on his face. Now in engineering, we try and locate things together in some way. So we have a concept of three-point location. And I've never worked in healthcare for this kind of thing. So I was wondering, how the hell are we going to locate this? Again, working with the surgeon, he came up with a very interesting idea. He said we can use the eye socket, okay, part of the nose and part of the ear. So that was our three-point location in this case. I actually, when I started working on this work, I was under the impression that I got to produce something to a very small accuracy. But when I talked to the surgeon, I realized he was so happy if I could make something within three millimeters. And as an engineer, Three millimeters is too big tolerance for us, okay? So it was a pleasure working on it. But I spent the first few weeks trying to make it within microns, okay? And I wasted my time. <laughs> this is the output of it. A young man badly scarred in a car accident is to benefit from pioneering technology developed at Warwick University. Instead of relying simply on their own judgment to remove facial scars, surgeons have used a computer to work out the very best option for surgery. Here's our science correspondent, David Gregory. The scars and the memory are still fresh for Phil Thomas. Lost control of the car. I'm blanked out, but I'm pretty, pretty much my head went through the window to the sat behind the driver and went up the wall, car went up the wall and rolled the car five or six times. Normally, surgeons remove this sort of scarring using their own judgment, but at the University of Warwick, they're using a computer to help. First, this new scanner creates a 3D picture of the patient's head. This is fed into the computer, and that will help surgeons work out the best way to cut out the scarring. It can also be used to allow surgeons to practice. Once this type of technology is used in the medical field, I mean, that's what I used to look like. <laughs> But they generally, it's so difficult line for us to communicate between the medics to identify what are your issues. Uh, I know I have a friend who is uh, in who is working with us on other things. But generally, there are only a few medics who are willing to come and listen to this kind of thing. Okay. It's uh, a good timing. Okay. I, I just wanted to talk one more thing, and then I have some other important thing to say. Another project that we are working on is around understanding the wellness. Now, I was very much interested again on Andrew's stuff about richness, wellness, mental state, and all this kind of thing. This is very important. As you know, most, a lot of Asians suffer from diabetes today because it's genetic or whatever medics tell me. But what is very important is when do you get diagnosed to be diabetic? If you've been diabetic without you realizing the effects of it, and it's five, ten years down the road, they find out, then uh, all you can do is a little few things for you, i.e. keep you on insulin or whatever. But the damage to your eyes, uh, your kidneys, might have already occurred. So what is the idea there? Is to identify this as early as possible. 
Now, I'll, I'll give you an example here of diabetes, because it's very close to me. Uh, everybody in my family is diabetic, and that's why I'm motivated to work in that area to see what can be done. But it's not just for diabetic. Most of you are not all patients at the moment. And it would be nice to monitor certain conditions of yourself, blood pressure, for example, yeah, kind of thing. If you monitor this, if there is any change, any trends that you can recognize, it would be very useful for you to go to your doctor and start asking the question, saying, look, my blood pressure is changing slowly, it's clipping up. And the, he can advise you, he or she, can advise you what to do and so on. And that could help you of not having to stay in a wonderful room in a hospital, almost like a five-star hotel or Dubai or something, <coughs> at a very expensive price, but not an enjoyable time like in Dubai Hotel, okay? And the idea is to keep you in your house more rather than the hospital. As you know, our hospitals currently are burdened with more people with more illness. So that's one of the projects that we're working on, is to say how can we bring this data and then use some of our, our techniques of analyzing the data and reporting to the right kind of people so they can take right action at the appropriate time. That really concludes the talk that I wanted to say, but I, I just want to ask one question to the audience. How many people do not have a mobile phone in this room? One, two, three, four, excellent. I, so that, the assumption is everybody else has a mobile phone. How many of you do texting on your mobile phone? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Why do you do texting? Because it's cheaper? No? Sorry? Everyone does it. Everyone does it, okay. I think the reason why we do texting in Europe mainly is because it's slightly cheaper than the actual mobile phone calls. Now, do you know the consequences of doing texting? I have my children in this audience, and I know what they do. They sit there and going like this while watching some program on the TV or talking to me, and tap, 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 whatever it is. <laughs> <laughs> but do you know what's happening to them? Yeah? This device is a, not a good device at all. It's designed for good purpose, but the financial model, which is again ethical issues I'm interested in, is saying it doesn't do much good to our fingers. What it actually does is create strain on yours. And I, I notice there are people here who use chopsticks to eat. If you start playing this texting, maybe in the future, you've got very little chance of holding the chopstick. So, what are you going to be? Burden on society. <laughs> Some I can talk about, some I can't, because some applications are with military application, and it's in this country, so I cannot talk about it, okay? So I'll keep quiet on the MOD kind of application, but I'll talk on other things. Uh, one of the things that we're looking at at the moment, which is a center in Italy, which is a research center that's been set up. Uh, this research center is looking at sort of psychology and neurology kind of aspects. And it's training people who have fear of heights and kind of things, phobias of different kinds. It's trying to treat this kind of people. And we're using cybersphere over there for putting people inside the sphere and then projecting, for example, spider, very small spider, and you have a fear of spider. And then what we do gradually is grow that spider. <laughs> But what we also do in there is we, instead of one spider, we surround you with spiders. But obviously not straight away because you will collapse. <laughs> the idea is to say, what are phobias? You know, basic thing. Why do we have a phobia? Okay. Yes, I have some scariness. Okay. How can I overcome that scariness? Like flying in an airplane. Okay. 
people are afraid. Some people will not even go up the steps of an airplane because they, are, they feel claustrophobic and they think, oh, height is going to be a problem. Some people don't like going in a lift, for example, because of a um, claustrophobic environment. So this is being used in Italy. Yeah? It's a company called Karma in Italy. I believe you're Indian. No? Okay, sorry, I made a wrong assumption there. <laughs> but Indians have a word called Karma, K A R M A. The company is not called K A R M A, the company is called C A R M A. But the guy who is the CEO of the company has come up with this name based on an Indian word called Karma. Okay, kind of thing. So that's where it's being applied. Uh, is there anyone else with a question? Sorry, uh, Oh, sorry. Uh, hi, thanks for the talk. Um, I was wondering if, at the moment, your solar sphere is really big and bulky and you couldn't really fit it inside a family home. Is there something you can see in the future that would be widespread, like home computers? Okay. We have a, a patent at the moment that's going through the system, which is called a reconfigurable display system, which we believe has a tremendous market in home cinema in the house. But it's not like that, it's slightly different. What it does, it creates a flat screen like this in the first instance. Uh, if you've got five, seven people in your family, your friends are there to watch the football match, okay, put it like this and watch the match. Now, if you're really excited about the football and you really want to be immersed in it, then you can actually make, by pressing a button, it will become cylindrical. You know what happens when we have a cylindrical uh, screen, the image gets distorted, so we have a correction algorithm that will correct it and show you the right thing. Now, because it's immersed, uh, sorry, cylindrical, you feel partial immersion in it. If you really want something better than that, you press another button, it gives you spherical, which is like that, but not a complete sphere. Okay? We are in the process of sorting out some business agreements with somebody who should market this. We are useless at marketing and we develop things uh, and we have no interest in selling companies either uh, because that's not the skills I have. But of course I'm interested in licensing, more money coming in so we can do more research and whatever. Uh, we have time for one last question. Anyone? Yep. Um, do you think with all this um, virtual retirement technology um, that people will end up living in their rooms? Yeah. <laughs> well, very interesting question because also if you, without this, the trend is happening in some ways because there is already a trend about working from home because internet enables you to do things. There is a cost of me taking a, a space in Warwick University, a building, and if I can do it from home, they'll they, they be very happy in some ways. Okay? But certain research I cannot do at home. So certain type of work, you can't be a doctor and say I'll work from home treating patients. Not today. There might be a future like that where you can actually treat them over a network. So you can actually drive instruments and whatever. But that's a long term from now. So I don't believe that you will end up in this cocoon kind of thing, a locked up, you know, in that environment. Can I just make one comment? The, let the or video conference that we had earlier on, imagine, was it Tom, yeah? Tom? Imagine that we could produce Tom here, and you could go and touch Tom. <laughs> <laughs> Not that you want to meet him, but you want to shake hands with Tom. <laughs> that's the next level of VR that's coming in the market. Okay, it's still in a research lab, but this will happen. So Tom can be anywhere else in the world. doesn't matter to us. Yeah? We can bring Tom here. This is a big application in the music industry. You can bring all, the whole orchestra from somewhere else, and I can be the singer here, live singer. Behind me, you will see the orchestra. Orchestra is somewhere else in the world, and it will be integrated. So to you, it appears like you, everybody's there. <laughs>